Welcome to Truth Tuesday. Now today I'm going to spend some time on the topic of fructose since a lot of people have been asking about it. And I've noticed a huge trend recently in the aversion to fructose and especially to fruit in the mainstream nutrition arena right now. Mostly because of the influence of the keto diet these days on the masses and all the misinformation surrounding that diet specifically coupled with a typical lack of critical thinking or common sense that's inherent in dogmatic thought movements. I'm going to take a thoughtful look at the keto diet in an upcoming Truth Tuesday. To illustrate the level of misinformation around fructose and fruit right now, I want to show you a screenshot of a post done by one of the biggest proponents and quote thought leaders of the keto diet right now. And this, in my opinion, is an extreme example of fruit aversion, but a very real one nonetheless. Meanwhile, the same people who demonize fruit are promoting eating an entire stick of butter as a meal. And that one stick of butter, in this case, uh, Kerrygold butter, it's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but that one thing, that one stick of butter has 1,600 calories of fat, and that's just one component of this meal. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. I don't want to pick on Jimmy specifically. He's a nice guy. I've been on his podcast before to teach natural testosterone tips to his audience, which includes carbohydrate consumption. But like so many of these health professionals or thought leaders out there right now that are shilling the keto diet, they've tied their personal identities to a diet plan ideology. And at a certain point, they get so deeply entrenched that there's no turning back or admitting fault without committing ego and career suicide. I want to make it clear, too, that I still respect any of these guys and gals out there that are trying to educate people on diet and nutrition. I'm not looking to call people out. I intend to keep everything positive and uplifting. So everyone who puts themselves out on the Internet to try and help people should be applauded because it's really not an easy thing. So I applaud them for doing what they think is right, but I just disagree with some of their details of their methodology, and I'm here to present and show my side of the argument here. Go on. So today I'm going to dive into this topic. Let's figure out where it all went wrong. Why do people think that eating fruit is going to make them fat? Is there any evidence of fructose consumption being the main driver of obesity? What does the scientific literature say on this topic? Is there any legitimacy to these claims or is it all a bunch of nonsense? Are you ready for today's Truth Tuesday? All right, brain. You don't like me and I don't like you. But let's just do this and I can get back to killing you with beer. It's a deal. Now, in the past decade or so, an argument's been presented for a causal role of fructose consumption as the key driver of the obesity epidemic. From this initial accusation, many other accusations around fructose have spawned in what appears to have become a slippery slope toward a total lack of common sense. Hello, I'm Dr. Stupid. I'm going to take out your liver bones. Yeah. Oops, you're dead. In fact, uh, the original seed of today's modern keto diet movement was planted from this exact line of logic. If fructose is causing obesity, then we must stop consuming sugars in order to burn fat for fuel, as they often say. In an attempt to find the source of this insanity, I comb back through PubMed to find a history of any evidence to support the claims that are being made around fructose. Everything has come from controversial interpretations of two distinct lines of research. Now, the first line of research involves mechanistic intervention studies where detrimental metabolic effects have been observed in humans and animals after excessive consumption of isolated pure fructose. The second line of research uh, involves food disappearance data that's interpreted as showing an increase in fructose consumption from added sugars that is paralleled with the rise in the obesity epidemic across modern populations. As I'm going to show in this video, neither of these lines of research has sufficient evidence to demonstrate a causal role of fructose consumption in metabolic disease. The evidence is actually quite to the contrary. Any claim nailing the obesity epidemic and metabolic disease to fructose consumption is merely conjecture requiring a massive leap beyond any reasonable assertion based on actual evidence. Most of the studies that have been done to this point were performed on subjects who were fed large amounts of pure fructose, a scenario that never occurs in real life for people. Most fructose is either consumed alongside glucose or with natural fibers and micronutrients that are found in fruits, or even in the case of high fructose corn syrup consumption with sodas alongside a meal consisting of other macronutrients. And I'm also going to get into high fructose corn syrup, how it's not pure fructose. It, there's a, a breakdown, there's glucose in it as well. Isolated fructose studies are not at all indicative of any real circumstance. To address the second line of research, the use of food disappearance data does not accurately reflect food consumption and hence cannot be used as evidence of a causal link between fructose intake and obesity. I'm going to get into more detail about that. After thoroughly reviewing the medical literature, of which I'm going to show you the important studies in this video, 
it is only logical to come to the conclusion that fructose as consumed from fruit but even when consumed from other common carbohydrate sources in, in the average diet does not exert specific metabolic effects that can account for an increase in body weight and is certainly not correlated or a causal role of the obesity epidemic. There's available evidence that links in an association but not a causation consumption of high fructose corn syrup sweetened beverages to weight gain. You know, we're gonna go through all the evidence that's out there. I'm gonna look at both sides of the argument here. First, we're gonna look at the studies that people are citing that um, for, for their accusations. And then we're gonna look at the, the remainder of the full context of the actual research and the review of the entire field of research, not just the cherry pick studies. And the interesting thing is that even in the studies that people point to for showing that, you know, in their mind that fructose causes obesity, the same research, it cannot draw a causation. It draws an association, which they're different. The same research actually points to the more important cause of the obesity epidemic being energy overconsumption. However, people just ignore that part of it because it's a bit inconvenient. Basically, uh, you know, eating too many calories. So there's a commonly known category of beverages that's called sugar sweetened beverages that, that's referred to very frequently in the literature. Uh, this category of drinks includes sodas, fruit drinks, sports drinks, ready to drink sweetened teas, uh, and coffees, rice drinks, bean beverages, sugared milks, and so forth. The increased intake of these beverages has basically been due uh, to increased marketing efforts and mass dis distribution of these drinks, especially in gas stations, convenience stores, as well as grocery stores, school vending machines for children. And uh, there's a lot of children at this point who've grown up um, as a, basically a generation of people who have drank these things since birth. Larger portion sizes have also become more prevalent, which have been shown to have been increased between three and five times over this period of time. Because of this, it's been found in research that a large amount of daily caloric intake for modern populations has consisted of uh, these sugar-sweetened drinks. All this being said, over the last 10 years, the global annual consumption of soft drinks has actually remained constant or declined depending on population data, while bottled water consumption has increased. Obesity rates, however, have continued to increase worldwide independently of these shifts of lower consumption of these sugar-sweetened beverages, which is an interesting observation, right? In light of all this, several medical reviews were done in uh, 2006 and in 2010 that concluded that the uh, consumption of sugary beverages was associated with both weight gain and type 2 diabetes. Again, there's never been any causation proven, just association, which makes sense, right? You know, based on like overconsumption of calories. And a major Australian survey found that sugary beverage intake is a key risk factor in cardiometabolic disease. However, due to the fact that sugary sweetened beverages are also they also go hand in hand with an overall increase in caloric consumption which is a key confounding factor here even major governing bodies like the european food safety authority concluded that additional justification of a direct correlation between sugar itself and adverse health effects is required there's not enough evidence for it this again is because total energy intake is always found to be over maintenance requirements in weight gain and type 2 diabetic populations independent of any specific type of macronutrient that's consumed. Ah, oh, yeah. Peanut butter cup, Dorito sausage, car panini. And let's crack a Cadbury egg over the whole thing. In fact, the only convincing, consistent evidence that has ever been found, and studies continue to come out on this fact, is that overconsumption of caloric intake, typically from foods high in both fat and sugar together, are responsible for the weight gain. I'm not really sure why this is such a radical thing for people to try and wrap their head around, it seems very much like common sense to me that if you eat more energy than your body needs for maintaining its metabolic requirements, especially if you consume this caloric surplus from high fat, high sugar foods that are also devoid in nutrients like donuts, cakes, junk food, fast food, all manner of toxic polyunsaturated fat rich junk foods, that you're going to gain weight. And as researchers have been concluding, the idea that these sugary beverages cause weight gain in themselves is a feel good idea. Yet when it comes to actual testing conditions, the evidence for its causal role is quite weak. So is there any evidence that specific sugars like fructose and glucose as present in sucrose and high fructose corn syrup promote excess caloric intake? Also, is there any evidence that this excess caloric intake from these sugars is more detrimental to health than excess caloric intake from energy as fat or as starchy carbohydrates like potatoes and rice? Let's take a look. 
Homer, all those fatty, deep-fried, heavily salted snacks can't be good for your heart. My heart is just fine. Identifying added fructose as the prime cause of obesity is completely misleading to the public, actually, as well as policymakers who, you know, in, in governing bodies like in, in Washington and the United States, who are now trying to do things like add taxes to certain foods. About the truth of obesity, in this case, the causality still remains unproven. Obesity is recognized to be a multi-factor related health problem in which lifestyle factors, eating behaviors, and socioeconomic aspects all play a key role. And fructose intake may be just one among several factors involved in the prevalence. At present, there are reasons to believe that isolated reductions in, adding, in added fructose containing sugar intake as recently investigated will not lead to a decrease in obesity prevalence. Fructose is considered by some authors to be the primary culprit for obesity and related disorders based on three categories of arguments. Now, the first one is arguments that generalized data derived from animal models of obesity in which sugar overfeeding was used as an experimental tool to increase body weight, as well as human studies in which excessive fructose intakes were used to study the mechanisms of metabolic dysregulation. Now, the second one is arguments that confuse the relative contents of glucose and fructose in industrial produced food and beverages. And third, arguments that underestimate our personal responsibility to remain physically active and to consume a healthy diet. A handful of unbalanced and scientifically irresponsible reviews on the topic have recently been published, including citations to other reviews instead of addressing the authentic data. In this video, I'm aiming to look at evidence regarding both positive and negative effects of fructose and fructose-containing sugar sources on obesity as described in recent peer-reviewed research papers. Now, in order to study the effects of fructose on metabolism, scientists have generally used dosages high enough to observe some significant effects mostly in animal studies and sometimes in human intervention research. The following findings here that I'm presenting are based on major publications commonly cited for the negative effects of fructose. Now it's important to note that fructose intake varies between individuals based on their daily consumption patterns. Through a 2008 US survey in 21,483 children and adults, it was found that the average intake of fructose in the US was 9.7% of total energy intake. Therefore, in the studies here that I'm showing you, let's go ahead and assume that fructose intake to be excessive, if it is pure intake, the amount is larger than 20% of the daily energy, even though that number is twice the average surveyed across the cross-section of the average American. We're gonna be generous here. As early as 1993, scientists began to look into the metabolism of fructose and they defined excessive pure fructose consumption as anywhere between 7.5% to 70% of daily energy intake, which admittedly is a very wide range that makes statistics very easy to manipulate on their end. It was in this range where researchers noticed an increase in de novo lipogenesis in both animals and humans because in different experimental settings, it circumvented inhibition feedback mechanisms that are present for glucose when it enters glycolysis. It was shown that the dietary fructose fraction not converted to lactate in the intestinal epithelium was rapidly taken up by the liver, where it subsequently was converted first into fructose 1-phosphate, then to triose phosphate, then pyruvate lactate. Those are both potential substrates for liver glycogen synthesis and for fatty acid production, leading to an increased tag release from the liver into the blood. In addition, it was found that high pure fructose loads 50% of total diet led to an increase in PPAR gamma coactivator 1-alpha and 1-beta, which promoted insulin resistance and lipogenesis, as well as decreased insulin receptor activation and increased receptor, insulin receptor substrate phosphorylation. Subsequently, lipogenesis induced by this high fructose load was associated with the formation of larger fat deposits in adipose tissue and muscle in animal models. However, there are no results of long-term human intervention studies available in which comparable quantities of fructose were investigated. One short-term intervention study, which was about nine, it was 96 hours, examined the effects of this 50% excess energy as fructose, sucrose, and glucose, and indicated that even under these drastic conditions, de novo lipogenesis remained just a minor pathway for fructose disposal in both lean and obese women. So in summary, it does appear that excess pure fructose consumption 
may have some metabolic effects, some metabolic negativities in animals and humans. I want to highlight and emphasize, however, that these studies feed excessive levels beyond what any normal person would ever consume, even if they drink a lot of sodas. For example, along with the fact that isolated fructose like that used in the studies is not something that anyone ever consumes in real life. Now, what's the problem with this evidence? Aside from the, these studies that I just mentioned where animals and humans were observed while taking these excessive doses of uh, pure fructose, there's actually been very little research done in humans while using any normal dietary intake of fructose. That's a bit frustrating to me since those other studies don't really mean anything to the condition of the average person. Why don't they use our tax dollar funding that they get from the NIH to actually do something useful that people can take insights from for their actual daily conditions? Probably because the results of a study on normal fructose intake from something like fruits aren't as grabby. You know, fruits are good for you doesn't make much of an interesting New York Times article headline, I guess. The entire claim that fructose intake is the cause of the current obesity epidemic relied upon correlation data between high fructose corn syrup intake and obesity in the U.S. This has been debunked along several lines of evidence. First, the correlation of high fructose corn syrup and obesity data only happened in North America. In Europe, there was also an increase in obesity prevalence during the exact same period, but high fructose corn syrup was not consumed to any significant amount. Moreover, the term high fructose corn syrup often led people to believe that it has a very high fructose content. In fact, the actual proportion of fructose to glucose in high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose, and in HFCS 55, it's 55% fructose, and in HFCS CS42, it's only 42% fructose, which is, that's used in most, you know, food applications. The HFCS55 is used in the soft drinks. So it's basically very similar to, to sucrose, which is a 50-50 uh, between fructose and glucose. Although absolute levels as analyzed in drinks might vary. <laughs> Whoa, that's good squishy. So in this respect, Free fructose content in sucrose sweetened acid-containing beverages such as colas was found to be increased during storage due to acid-induced sucrose hydrolysis. And here's something that nobody's going to tell you here. These studies, nobody will show these to you who has this argument against sugar. Four large and very thorough cohort studies showed no relationship between moderate sugar intake and type 2 diabetes. The question of whether the aforementioned effects are really caused by fructose can therefore not be answered by the observational data since these show only associations and not causality. A New York Times article in 2012 actually pointed out that due to incorrect methodology, U.S. sugar consumption in recent years has been overestimated by over 20%. Interestingly, the author implied that sugar consumption has not risen substantially since the 1980s. In addition, data obtained from the U.S. National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys in 2005 through 2010 concluded that total energy intake from added sugars has remained rather constant and has even potentially declined in some segments of the population in these years. Yet obesity continues to rise in these same populations. Causation debunked. All right, let's look at is fructose actually toxic? Now, I see a lot of comments, people saying fructose is, is toxic for you. Fructose is as toxic as alcohol, blah, blah, blah. And this is all relied on um, the idea of the relationship of fructose in the liver, which we're going to get into. All right, so three human studies have found that in humans, even when consumption is excessive of fructose over the short term, there's actually been no change in these studies. No change is observable in whole body or muscular insulin resistance in the subjects. This suggests that the human body has a very large capacity for metabolic plasticity and can adapt quickly to the intake of excessive sugars over the short term. There's been no evidence that relatively high levels of fructose sweetened drinks consumption, um, for example, like sports drinks, like Gatorade, Powerade, or energy drinks, could be associated with obesity, diabetes, or cardiometabolic risk in athletes who usually consume these drinks as energy and dehydration prevention drinks. On the other hand, there is actually evidence that physical inactivity, even within a few days, you know, this is independent of diet, causes insulin resistance and dyslipidemia in normal healthy individuals. Let me reemphasize that. If the human body is active, drinking sugar sports drinks causes zero metabolic shifts in the body. However, if the human body remains inactive for even just a couple days, independent of diet, 
it begins to become insulin resistant and shifts to conditions that are favorable for artery clogging atherosclerosis, which is dyslipidemia. Um, okay, this is news to me. Uh... It's time to stop blaming anything other than people's own inactivity and overconsumption of caloric energy for their obesity, diabetes, and metabolic disease. Now, let's take a look at the liver. It's generally considered and believed that the consumption of fructose leads to an immediate increase in lipid synthesis in the liver, which I talked about earlier where these studies were linking that, and a subsequent increase in circulating TAG. Now, this assumed relationship between fructose, lipid synthesis, and hypertriglycerolemia has been extrapolated to obesity. However, careful studies in human subjects using stable isotopes do not confirm this relationship. Now this study right here observed that after a load of uh, 0.75 grams of fructose per kilogram body weight, the enhanced postprandial elevation of plasma tag is mainly explained by a small impact of fructose on insulin compared with glucose, reducing tag clearance rather than as a result of new synthesized lipids, which appear to be very, very small. Now, given the fact that about 50% of a fructose load is converted into glucose, 25% into lactate, and approximately 15% into glycogen, de novo lipogenesis is only a minor pathway for fructose disposal. Now, this is in line with substantial evidence that's been reviewed in this review right here. Again, I'll link all these, these studies out in the uh, description of this video. Um, Hellerstein and, and colleagues, basically they summarize the evidence as follows. Now first, after consumption of a normal diet, less than 3% of post-absorptive uh, VLDL was estimated to come from this sugar. Less than 3%. In the fed state, less than 5% of the VLDL post-absorptive comes from sugar. And then when given 250 grams of fructose within 6 hours, less than 10% of that fructose load was converted to lipids. Daily overfeeding with 150 to 200 grams of fat and combined with 750 to 1000 grams of carbohydrate that led to a de novo synthesis of lipids so again this points to um, what we found earlier where it's it has more to do with overfeeding and overfeeding on the combination of fat and carbohydrates together oh my head the remorse of the sugar junkie Accordingly, the author of that review, um, Hellerstein, logically concluded that de novo lipogenesis, even after the successive fructose consumption, is actually extremely small. Myth busted. The explanation for these observations is that the consumed carbohydrates are primarily cleared from the blood to be oxidized in energy metabolism and or stored as glycogen at the expense of fat oxidation, which drops due to lipolysis inhibition by insulin and reduced non-essential fatty acid availability. Therefore, only small amounts of these lipids are synthesized after large fructose, sugar, or carbohydrate load consumption unless extreme carbohydrate overloading is sustained for days. It has to be sustained for several days to even see a, a big impact on it. There we go again, highlighting the impact of overfeeding being implicated in fat gain and being implicated in de novo lipogenesis. This does not have to do with the fructose itself it's overfeeding oh yeah well i challenge you to prove to me that i'm fat this is an inconvenient truth for just you know for a lot of people apparently this is an inconvenient truth however the evidence just continues to keep stacking up that that is the cause of obesity it's not um isolated things like just fructose all right so what did we just learn ah uh, wow okay um if you just watched this whole video, thank you for watching. We covered some, some major ground. Uh, you're definitely better educated after spending a few minutes with me today. I appreciate your attention on this important subject. See this? Yeah. You know what it is? Uh, yeah, it's an apple. Good, good, good. Well, let's sum up the main points that we just covered so you can remember all the takeaways accurately. So first off, as we mentioned near the beginning, there's this paranoid hysteria right now around fructose and even fruit intake where the masses of people that they think that fructose is responsible for the rise in obesity. If someone was to only read headlines and not actually look at the fact that any study that's showing negative impact of fructose involves massively excessive pure fructose consumption, a situation that does not happen, even in the most sugar addicted human, then I can definitely see where this hysteria has come from. However, the actual evidence does not add up for this causality. In fact, there's a large body of evidence pointing to the fact that regular dietary fructose consumption has zero correlation whatsoever with the rise in obesity, increases in insulin resistance, and we even debunked the implication that fructose consumption causes lar large-scale de novo lipogenesis in the liver. 
Now to drive this point home, I want to show you this systematic review of uh, sweetened beverage consumption, which re-examined uh, the large body of evidence from 40 observational studies and four intervention studies, as well as six entire reviews on the subject. Now this researcher noted that the totality of what people consider evidence was dominated by only American studies, and that most studies suggest that the effect of these sugar-sweetened beverages is small, except in susceptible individuals involving genetic predispositions, psychological factors, and environmental stimuli, or at excessive levels of intake, which they're measuring as over 20% of daily total energy. Now, she reported that progress in reaching a definitive conclusion on the role of these beverages in obesity is hampered by the lack of actual good quality intervention studies, which reliably monitor diet and lifestyle, as well as adequately report the effect sizes. Now, of the three long-term, which they were uh, long term is considered over, over six months for an intervention study. Of the three studies of those, actually, one reported an actual observed decrease in obesity prevalence uh, and no change in average BMI when consuming fructose. So, what does this all mean? What do I recommend after this entire big analysis? Well, first off, I recommend that you don't be afraid of consuming fruits in your daily diet. The evidence, even for sugary sweetened drinks, leading to any sort of negative effects in active people is weak to non-existent. I personally think that consuming a lot of soda is bad for you over the long term, potentially for two reasons. One is the lack of nutrients, leading eventually to deficiencies, and then second is the possibility that could lead to overconsumption of calories. However, neither of these involve the fructose itself. And I'm really just saying this to highlight to you and show you that even on the end of the spectrum that most health conscious people would consider a great evil, you know, for example, like drinking sodas and sugary drinks, there really is not enough convincing evidence of the sugar in these drinks being toxic to the body in any way. Now there's there's other chemicals typically in these, these drinks that can have a negative effect, but we're not focused on that in this video, we're talking about the sugar itself. So don't freak out about eating fruit, especially when fruit is vibrantly rich in micronutrients and contains the right amount of natural fiber and pectin that acts as a great prebiotic to the gut as well. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be busting some more common myths in these upcoming videos. Thank you for watching and I really appreciate you.